Meccano part number P205 engine from the 1933 aeroplane constructor set. If Meccano made beers, it'll probably be Carlsberg. Hi folks and welcome back. This week it's the next instalment from the 1933 aeroplane constructor set, the 10th build, the single seat fighter. So tally ho and chocks away. With each of these builds, I've said the same thing. How much I love them. How just about perfect they seem to me. And while I built this model, I was wondering why that was so, reflecting on what makes them so special to me. Partly, I think, is because until around 2018 or so, I knew nothing about them. They just came up in a random eBay search one day. But also, with one of my passions being history, I really enjoyed the script writing side of these builds. There was so much lost history with each model, from a time when aviation was one of the final frontiers to be conquered. And thirdly, they are so reminiscent of a bygone era, that short brief one generational gap of the 1920s to the 1940s. The last period of a wonderful dream, the romance of the period. That there were still frontiers to cross, deeds to do, and the future of science was beckoning, and it was going to be a golden future. It was a time of change. Russia had just disappeared in a revolution that shook the world. The aftermath of the First World War had our nation reeling in shock, not just from the cost of the war, from a fiscal point, but the very real cost in human terms. And neither of my grandfathers ever really recovered from it, both forever changed by the deeds that they'd partaken in. And the romance of the period still lives on in our modern culture, with the era being looked back on with rose-tinted glasses as being a time of innocence and a happier, slower, more contented life. I have doubts if it was as wonderfully perfect as my parents remember it being. Looking back as I have in their older years, on a moment that is blurred with the passage of time and the forgetfulness of memory. With the death of Victorian Britain and the rise of the modern era that exploded post-World War II, the world changed beyond recognition between 1940 and 1950. Britain, in the late 1920s and the 1930s, was defended by two aircraft. They never saw combat in the skies over Britain. They never defended this nation. And I think if they had, they might well not have been up to the task. They were the gate wardens that guarded us while the Spitfire and Hurricane were developed and brought up to squadron strength. The Hawker Fury I wrote about in the Interceptor Fighter two months ago. Its stablemate was a Bristol Bulldog and was the end result of design studies carried out by Captain Frank Barnwell, XREF, in the 1920s. In response to the 1924 Air Ministry's specifications for operational requirements, known as OR F17-24. The design was shelved as Captain Barnwell intended to use the Rolls-Royce Falcon engine. Bristol having their own engine really didn't want to pay Rolls-Royce for an underpowered engine which only generated 288 brake horsepower. When the Bristol Jupiter, then in development, looked sure to generate around 550 horsepower. But that's the price of buying a brand name product. It doesn't always mean it's better, it just costs more. By 1926, the Type 105 was dusted off and now powered by the new Jupiter was to be entered into the OR F20-27 trials. Pulling what is called a fast one, Bristol entered it into the 26 trials instead as a private venture. It was rather well liked by the RAF. In fact, by May of 1927, the first Bulldog prototype flew against the Hawker Hawfinch. And it was there that a problem was discovered. The Bulldog did not recover well from a spin, to mildly understate it. To fix that, they enlarged the fin and rudder 
which then led to difficulties and taxiing in a crosswind. As is always the case, you fix one thing and then find you caused a problem elsewhere. The design was so close between the Bulldog and Hawfinch that in the end it was given to service personnel to evaluate both aircraft. The Bulldog won based on the fact that it was the easier of the two aircraft to service and maintain. By the 10th of October 1929, the first of the Bulldogs were in squadron service. But there were problems on the horizon with them. The instability of the airframe, with the tendencies to go into a spin when close to the ground, led to a ban on aerobatics being carried out by pilots. One young pilot was not to heed these orders, much to his discomfort, but more on that later. The Bulldog's designer, Captain Barnwell, is a man of his generation and period in history. A lot of what he did just would not be allowed now, thanks to a little thing called health and safety. He was a Scottish aeronautical engineer from Glasgow, born in 1880. And along with his brother Harold, they built their first glider in 1905 and went on to build three powered aircraft from the workshops in Causeyway Head in Stirling. The first aircraft was woefully underpowered and failed to get off the ground, but the second did fly on the 28th of July 1909. Piloted by Harold, it took off from underneath the shadow of the Wallace Monument and flew for around 80 yards or 75 metres until it crashed. Its maximum altitude was around 4 metres, or just over twice the height of the average person. The third aircraft was a prize-winning competition aircraft, winning them £50. Out of interest, my maternal grandfather was a master in a private school, and his wages for the year at that time were around £50. So around six months' wages each was not bad. Harold would sadly die in 1917, when as a test pilot for Vickers, he crashed in the experimental Vickers Vampire Night Fighter on the 25th of August, failing to recover from a spin. In 1938, Frank was also killed while test flying an aircraft he'd privately built himself. The aircraft struck a bump while taking off from Bristol Whitchurch Airport. The aircraft was thrown into the air in an uncontrolled manner and then stalling due to a lack of forward airspeed. It crashed onto a nearby road. He left behind a wife and three sons, varying in age from 16 to 22, all of whom would join the RAF. His middle son, John, would be sadly killed on June the 19th, 1940, while engaging enemy bombers. Flying a Mark I Bristol Blenheim, an aircraft his father had designed, he was reported missing over the North Sea after failing to return. His body was washed up two and a half weeks later on the 5th of July. Three months later, his eldest son, Richard, along with the rest of his crew, would be killed some 20 miles out to sea, east of Aberdeen, piloting an Armstrong Whitworth Whitley bomber of Coastal Command. They had signalled a successful attack on an enemy that subsequently crashed into the sea. Their bodies would never be recovered. Almost to the day, a year later, on the 19th of October 1941, his youngest son, David Barnwell, DFC, would also be killed, being shot down in the Mediterranean by the Italian Air Force, while flying his Hurricane Mark II C. As with his eldest brother, David's body would not be recovered. I talked before about the pilot who did not obey the strict standing orders forbidding unauthorised aerobatics below 2,000 feet in the Bristol Bulldog. Of that pilot was Douglas Barder, on the 14th of December 1931, while visiting Reading Aero Club, and apparently on a dare, Barder was showing off his piloting skills, very close to the ground, 
when he dug his port lower wing into the ground. The accident would cost Barda both his legs, one being amputated above the knee and the other below. In his logbook, Barda entered the following comment. Crashed, slow rolling near ground. Bad show. He spent the next five years fighting to be allowed to serve with the RAF, believing he still had a lot to offer. It wasn't until the commencement of hostilities that he was allowed to reapply. And even then, the powers at B were against allowing him to return to full status as a flying pilot. He proved them wrong, showing that even with two legs missing, he was still able to outfly many able-bodied people. He was shot down on the 9th of August 1941 over France and spent the rest of the war as a prolific escapee until finally he was sent to Oflaf 4C, better known as Colditz. And here he would spend the rest of the war until April the 15th 1945 when the first United States Army liberated the camp. Post-war, he was employed by Shell. When he'd first had his accident, they had offered him a job, and as such he felt that he owed them a debt. Seeing when everybody else had turned him away, they had offered him a billet. And they would allow him to fly. In my research of him, I've only touched on his career very briefly here. He is described as being a very difficult person with a forceful personality. I'm left somewhat in awe of the man at a time when being disabled was seen as something to hide away, not to allow the person to be seen in polite company in case they offended somebody. Barda stood tall. As a double amputee, he showed what could still be done, what could still be achieved. That just because, by some cruel twist of fate, or in his case, thinking that the rules didn't apply to him, you should not go and hide. A spirit is still striving for your best. Because for all his overbearing attitude and bad language, he did his best to show the world what people with disabilities could achieve long before people were trying to do so. He was one of the first that fought the battle for equality that in many ways we now take for granted.